I just think right now, women, especially in business, this is the year of women. I just know that. Life begins at 150 grand a year. Life gets better at 250, and life gets real good at 500. Nobody can tell me differently on it. When you start teaching something, I feel like that's when you start to master the actual art of it. You and I, when we publish a book, we can go toe-to-toe with any of the New York trade publishers, any of the big-time authors, and we get to compete in that marketplace and then let the market decide whether our stuff is good. People forget sometimes as an entrepreneur, the whole damn point of entrepreneurship is to make money. And now here is The Win with your hostess, serial entrepreneur, marketeer, and chief sexy boss. Heather Havenwood. Have you ever wanted to stop the nine to five grind and start your own company? Do you want to have more control of your income and your time? Then now is that moment to start and grow a successful business. As a female entrepreneur, I have succeeded. I have bit the dust. I have bounced back to growth and prosperity. But this would not have been possible without first taking the leap and owning my own business. But I didn't do it alone. I hired my first business coach 13 years ago. And now I help small businesses, solo practitioners, and professionals double their income and triple their time off. So let me help you too. My gift to you today is a free one-on-one strategy session. So go to coachwithheather.com, coachwithheather.com. And let me help you double your income and triple your time off. Hi, everyone. Welcome to The Win with Heather Havenwood. You can check me out. You can go to text the word Heather to 72000 to get three free chapters of my audio book. But today we have someone on the phone today on the line, on the video, on the, not even the phone. Is that even a thing anymore? <laughs> Do people have phones? Um on the line on the podcast phil singleton are you there i'm here awesome thanks for being there so you're in kansas city i am phil is the author of seo for growth Um, he's a web designer and seo expert and award-winning author and since 2005 phil has owned and operated a digital marketing agency in kansas city um, and he has written some amazing books with some really cool people whose names I can't even pronounce, but you can go check him out in the Amazon at SEO for growth. We're going to talk to him a little bit about today of how basically SEO consultants and authors and speakers really should still be using SEO, which nowadays no one really talks about. I think that's an interesting piece. So let's talk about this first aspect you said to me in the green room, which is I become more famous by writing the coattails of other people. What do you mean by that? Well, I meant for a lot of us, especially for myself. I mean, I got into finance and then search and optimization kind of a little bit more of an introvert by nature. So yeah. it was nice for a long time with Google to be able to help clients out kind of in a back room without having to talk to people. Right. Um, but about five or six years ago, Google really changed the game and they kind of chased a lot of us um, SEO consultants out of our back caves and holes um, and made us put ourselves out there because they start to um, count things more like, you know, content marketing and blogging and they want to check and, and know where your, your authority is and, and check other signals out on the internet like social media, um, your social media presence and your online reputation, all these kind of things. So that really changed the game. Once they kind of went from you know grading these back office, under the hood type, backlink type things and making that part of the algorithm and started to look more at kind of the, your whole digital picture online and ranking yeah. that, that changed a lot, which meant guys like me had to get out there, put ourselves out there, right? We had to kind of prove our own authority. Um, and to do so, we mm. had to do things like to, like blogging and in some cases, you know, write, uh, write books and this kind of stuff. So in my case, mm-hmm. you know, for a lot of these guys out and ladies out there you know, who are out there and have actually built an audience that trusts them, there's a lot of time and effort that goes into that, Right. Um, but for somebody like me who might not have the charisma or um, wants to maybe fast track that kind of thing, I thought, well, what's the best way to get out there and try to leverage somebody else's audience without having to go through that, first of all, yeah. maybe not having the time. And secondly, maybe I wouldn't even be able to do that in the first place. I just don't have that kind of you know, talent in particular. Um, so what I did is I ended up joining a Duct Tape Marketing uh, um, Consulting Network. And yeah. I did so because John Jantz is a guy that is known by many people um, as a small business marketing expert. Yeah. He wrote Duct Tape Marketing. It's a Wall Street Journal bestseller. Blah, blah, blah. But he's got a hundred or so um, small business marketers in his in his network. 
um, which was great. It gave me a chance to, in this case, you got a lot of these guys out there that have like courses and, you know, things where you can actually have some amount of contact in Facebook groups and this kind of stuff with these influencers. But there's a few of them, like Michael Port, like John Jantz, I'm sure there's other ones out there, where you've got the opportunity to join more of an intimate network. In this case, I was able to join and actually meet with him, you know, a couple times on an annual basis and rub shoulder to shoulder, which gave me more of a personal relationship. It also gave me the opportunity to give more. So I got into that network and earned his trust by educating other people's, you know, other consultants in the network and doing webinars and doing guest blog posts and really trying to give, give, give to show my stuff. Eventually, I think I got to the point after two or three years where I was able to pitch him on a book project. Um, really for the purpose of trying to build my own influence. Yeah. And that's kind of how I, sh- I kind of short track, you know, my, my short, education there. That's really awesome. Well, good. So, I mean, nowadays uh, SEO is something that I don't even talk about with a lot of my clients at the time. Uh, I focus a lot on content marketing and things like that. I don't know. I, I want you to sell me right now. I, don't, I think SEO is dead. All right. I think a lot of people do. And I think in the traditional sense of how people think about SEO, it kind of is. But Google isn't. You know, Google's not dead. Google's what do you a, mean by that? I'm, I'm going to interrupt you, by the way. So what do you mean by that Google's not dead? Obviously, Google's not dead. But I mean, there's things have changed a lot. Google keeps changing the algorithm. So where's the weight now? Where's the weight? So if you're a small business, I mean, I have a, a friend right now who's in he's a lawyer locally. He had one really crazy client. I mean, like off the chain, can't chain. And um, this person went off on him on Rip Report. And now when you type his name in or his law firm, it's like on the first page. I mean, how do you, what does Google do now? You're just proved in some ways that Google's not dead, right? This is a pain point for this gentleman because he knows for some people searching his brand, it comes up number one all of a sudden. Um, In the negative sense, it it can be a pain point for that person. Yeah. But if I can take a step back, because I love the question and people don't hit it pinpoint anymore like that and say SEO is dead. But I think a lot of people do think it is dead in some way because they throw money at it and it doesn't work is really really kind of what it boils down to. Well, I would say they don't even throw money at all. If they have a budget, they're looking at their budget and they're like, where am I going to put the money? If I was consulting them right now, I would say, well, don't put on SEO, focus on paid media. Right. Okay. So, I mean, that's a great point. Okay. So so the first point I'd like to make is one, I like to tell people that, so we, because we pitch this all the time every day where people are like, where should I put my money? How should I put it? Every day I pull up the same screen from Dogs of the Dow and I show them the top five um, most valuable companies in the world by market capitalization. And it's pretty much the last two years have been the same. It's been Apple, Google, Facebook, Amazon, and Microsoft. That's the internet and that's the way that we buy stuff online. It's Google, it's search, it's paid advertising, yeah. it's social media. So so in that, in that mix, I mean, it's hard to say Google's not a big part of where you need to be because it's not just a place to generate leads. It's, it's part of the purchase process. Period. There's no debating that. No matter what anybody says, everybody does secondary searches, and most of the time they use a Google search to do that. And that's kind of where they own us. It's it's beyond you know being a cool tech company. I think it's a pure monopoly, and they are part oh, of yeah. the modern purchase process. So that's my first hard pitch to you on that piece of okay. Not being so dead. all right, let's how do you influence it? it then? If you, if you buy that, are you buying it's, it? Or not? I, so it's part of the purchase process. I will I will concur. I will concur because when I look at purchase process, i.e. sales process, I have an image, okay, of growing up, I grew up in the 80s, okay, so we had the pool in the backyard with the with the little slide, you know, and you go up and down and over a thousand times in the 80s. We thought that was amazing because we didn't have cell phones back then, so we had to go outside. So that's what I see is the sales process. You get on the slide and you fall into the water and that's when they start purchasing. So I get that because Google, no matter what, is part of the sales process. So I will concur on that. I think it goes a little bit deeper than that because we counsel people all the time, especially when we get the, the middle to older generation of folks who only know outbound marketing. Right. They come into our agency and they say, we don't understand why TV, radio, and some of this outbound stuff doesn't work because we used to be able to do this, um, pay a certain amount of money and get a predictable amount of sales. It, I, it does work. It still works really great or people wouldn't be doing it. The problem is, is when you generate the outbound demand, really all that you do is if we, we've already agreed that Google's part of the purchase process, right. you drive people back to the Internet. And the people that are kicking your ass with reputation because you're showing up on Rip, Rip Off Report, you don't have any reviews, your website sucks, they can't see you on social media, you're not blogging, you're going to push that, you're going to spend your money and they're going to steal your marketing dollars because they own the piece when it filters back to the Internet. And that's the truth 
of modern markets. So you have to kind of figure out how to get this piece of um, Google because it's part of the purchase process. And I think it really can't be avoided if you truly want to grow your company. So if I've sold you on that piece, then I got to get you like, okay, you said, I agree. I can see how it can help you grow your, your business. So then how much do, is it a consistent ongoing, we got to pay X amount per month forever to to an SEO company? Because that's how it used to be. I don't know if it's still like that, where versus going in and fixing all the SEO and then dropping, you know, and really increasing everything. Because I think that SEO is one of those things not to be, you know, negative, but it just feels like it just never damn ends. It's like it's a, really, we're the used car sales with the internet. It, I mean, it's a slimy place. It's Most a people slimy have horror place. stories and not success stories. Um, it's a it's a slimy place. It's just it's a never ending pest pimple that will never go away, and it never ends. There's never like okay, that's handled with SEO. You know what I mean? Yes, and cars. I think what happens, I know for myself, I just kind of go, oh, forget it. You know, just. Just, just let's stop, you know, because it's like an ongoing forever, forever, ever. And I'm looking for that ROI. If I'm going to do a, write a check over and over and over again to TV, radio, Facebook ads, at least I can see an ROI. I can see like, oh, we made X, but like with SEO, it's kind of this, how do you even calculate the ROI? I think it, you know, all kind of factors in together and there is a, there are ways to calculate it, but the yeah. big moral of the story and the reason we wrote the book SEO for growth was to show people how Google is starting to count things. Mm. It used to be just about guys tweaking stuff under the hood, trying to find loopholes, trying to create doorway pages with keyword stuff and all kind of or stuff. Or PR, remember PR was a big one, PR stuff. Press stepping. releases, and really anything. Well, the press, it was really anything that generated a high volume of third-party backlinks pointing right. back to your website. That moved the dial for years and years and years. In fact, Google was saying content was king for a long time, but a lot of us in the SEO industry were like, but we see what's actually working. We generate a bunch of these links and it works. And then what ended up happening is you got a lot of companies, even mainstream companies, that got busted for it eventually. JCPenney, eBay, Overstock.com. Um, once Google, I think, started seeing that people were really manipulating, trying to manipulate the system on a large scale, five, six years ago, they totally changed how they rank companies and they made their, it, it used to be a solely almost like a reward-based system, yeah. but about five or six years ago, it moved to more of a punitive type of an algorithm. So not only, you know, it used to be throw the stuff up against the wall, we'll count what sticks. Now you throw up against the wall stuff that drops, they're going to penalize you for what drops. So <laughs> you know, what does that mean? It means you can't do volume-based backlinking anymore. Backlinks still are really super important, but it counts where they come from in terms of quality and relevance, not in terms of volume. So if you're doing a bunch of volume based stuff it gets really risky because you risk getting a you know link based uh, penalty from the the code name penguin is the one they call it penguin. or messing around is your penguin, website is penguin it doesn't make still any around? sense to do stuff is, Peng is penguin still around or they upgraded to like seal or something <laughs> It is still around, but it went from uh, they they'd actually do manual updates of that one until it got up to a certain point, and then they actually just rolled it into their everyday algorithm. So it's like a real time algorithm now. It's part of the the core algorithm that they have. So it's still you know they still scrutinize links to a, a large degree. So that's what ended up happening. The five or six years when, when that happened is they um, it really changed behavior in a good way. It got stuff offshore on back onshore, yeah, and it got people thinking more about SEO from a kind of a consultant basis and a holistic marketing type of thing yeah instead of just this back office thing like let's write a check and and pray you know for rankings type of thing so let's talk about a, just how much does an seo cost i know there's definitely ranges but if you have like let's say this take this friend of mine who's a lawyer right and uh he's a local business so he's you know he's local a, meaning his clients are local or does he's his, a niche well what's national? interesting his clients i talked to him about that actually he because of his particular kind of law he does get clients in uh, in austin i'm in austin austin houston dallas and he gets clients because he's a business attorney type thing that uh he has clients in new york and california that have done business in texas and they have to arbitrate and arbitrate in texas so Actually, he gets clients from other places as well. So if he's local, I mean, how much does it cost? Well, it kind of depends. I mean, generally speaking, for what a local business. What would be a business, healthy or unhealthy budget? How about that? Yeah, I mean, we actually spell it out right in the book. I mean, generally, if once you start getting into the $1,000 and under range for yep. a local business, that's where most of the snake oil is sold. Okay? So a good SEO program, and you got to hear me out on this, is probably going to usually be between 1000 to $5,000 a month, which sounds like a ton. Um, but if you look at what goes into SEO these days, it really becomes more of an SEO-driven digital marketing program, okay? 
Because when we, like for instance, when we deliver SEO and you hear about how the things that we do for our companies, it really sounds a lot more like digital marketing than it does just SEO. So give me an example. If you said you're going to work with this client or even me, I mean, if I'm thinking myself, going to write you a check for $2,000 a month, what are you doing? What are you doing for that? Other so part of it's going to be doing the audit, going through the website, making the car as fast as possible, so to speak. So there's a setup fee sure. involved in that. Then there's the ongoing SEO piece of it, which involves going out and trying to do some type of high quality link building because you can't ignore link building. But a lot of it has to do with creating content and getting your content out on third party websites that make sense. It's also blogging. In a lot of cases, I don't know. I mean, you're actually creating great content through a blog or through podcasting, right? But right. I, I didn't check to see how much you're actually blogging if you're blogging on a regular basis i um, am oh god did you so check my alexa or something did you like stalk me i actually have your website pulled up on ahrefs right now and oh god. it's one of the things that we do when we go out and outreach to podcast guests is i'm specifically looking for people that have authoritative websites that have value do i so have when value I land, yes you do <laughs> when i land on your web when i land on your show notes page the backlink that you give me through a resource link is going to be a truly organic earned backlink that's going to help me out um, in addition to sharing this knowledge. So that's part of SEO that most people don't do. In fact, there's a whole thing, there's a whole list of things I came up with with just podcasting in general that I think most people miss in terms of the oh, extra value. Oh, I love, value love to give. hear about that because I did this. I mean, I like one of the reasons I got into podcasting was because as a guest. I've been on over 300 podcasts was because of backlinks, right? Because they're supposed to put my website on their show notes page. Not everyone does it though, but I figured if I've done 300 podcasts at this point in the last 24 months, I think I've have, so I don't even know how to, how do I check that? I should have at least 150 to 200 backlinks at this point. You would want to go into Google search console, make sure that you're set up and they'll show you all the links that are pointing back to your website that Google's counting and you'll be able to see each site. Okay. And Google then search console. Now I heard, give me this. I heard that if they if they put my website on their like backlink was www dot and it wasn't http, that it won't backlink. Is that right? No. I mean, it's got to be a hot link in some in some way, shape, or form. So if it's a raw link or a here or your brand name or some kind of keyword anchor, I mean, they've all got slightly different. Um, types of waiting, but as long as there's actually something that links back and it's not like an, un sometimes you'll see on websites like an unlinked link, like it it's actually looks like a link, but it's not, they didn't no, have no, a like code. It, I just through. heard that if it's a www.heatherhaywood.com and it does go, go, but they, someone say, well, it doesn't, Google doesn't see that as a backlink. It has to be HTTP colon forward slash forward slash. Oh. So that's not true. Oh, there is a little bit of, there's in the back end, there's going to be some redirection. If your yeah. if your site is like doesn't have the the www on it as default when you land on it, right? But there's a tiny tiny little bit of SEO juice that's lost um, if if there's the 301 redirects on it, but it's negligible. Um, where you really can lose things, where you got to pay attention to, is a lot of sites that go out there, especially the top media sites right now. If you get a link from them, especially an advertisement, they put what's called a no follow tag on it, which is a which is explicit to Google to say don't pass any SEO equity. This is a paid link. So some people you see nowadays make them as no follow and they're nice for branding, they're nice for traffic, but they don't do really much anything else for, for SEO. So you, you got to kind of look out for those if you're doing um, some a link well, building I don't campaign. think podcasters would be doing that. I haven't seen any. <laughs> I don't think so well, anyway. Most of them don't know that. They don't know that. Don't tell about. them. Shh. Okay, uh, let's not tell them. But for advertising paid, I like that makes sense. If I'm paying, then I, they don't want to give me the. Um, well, you can get. I mean, advertisers are doing it and don't know follow. I mean, they can get. They can get penalized by Google for it. Google will call them out and say, "Hey, this is passing." You know, the big sites and stuff like that. So they're all advertisers. I think are really savvy on this piece because they've already been confronted by it in some shape or form. Well, like I said, I this I don't have any really bad ripoff report stuff, which is thank goodness, right? But I, uh, like I said, I was talking to this friend of mine who's a lawyer, and when he showed me that, it was like, wow, how do I, you know, and I want to help him out. I want to see if I can get that down at least to page two, just like, and you don't know this whole situation. I'm just throwing it like the egg to you a little bit. But what would you? even suggest to him to help that process because Ripper Fort is a huge authority site. Right, right. But it can it can definitely be beaten. That's why you don't see everybody's branding that, excuse me, comes up, has that type of thing. So I've actually got a whole blog post that ranks number one for what it is called what is SERP stacking, S-E-R-P stacking. And what it is is it's trying to do everything that you can, and this applies to reputation management as well, yeah. to show up as many times as you can on a page. 
So there are certain things you can do, obviously, to get um, more links. You can optimize all sorts of things. Your Facebook page, your obviously your website, you know, BBB. There's all sorts of things you can do to run these little SEO programs and do barnacle SEO on them, meaning that you're actually trying to leverage their authority to get that page to rank because it has a lot of authority in itself. So where Ripoff Reports is coming up on its own by itself, nobody's really doing link building to it. You could essentially treat that Ripoff Report page, think of it this way, think of it as You've got another page, like your own page on, on BBB or your own Yelp listing or um, your other, you know, there's all sorts of other directories and listings you can show up on. You can make sure that you've got those set up, that they're optimized, that you've got a lot of rich content on them and maybe do a little bit of link building to those. Now, all of a sudden, you start to rise up, you know, and show up on multiple places for your own brand name and start to maybe push down that um, ripoff report that you're never really going to get rid of. No, at least push never gonna down. Get rid of. But we can maybe get it to the second page yeah. or third page down the road. But it takes work on that. That kind of reputation, man, it really takes work and it takes time. So Yeah, I, I, when I talk to him, he's like, well, I'll just, I'm just going to super rip off report. I'm like, don't even bother. <laughs> just That's like, what they want, I think. Waste. I mean, it's almost like a badge on I know, just don't. Right. I, that's what I told him, but you know, he didn't like that. I just, you know, I was like, I just said, just don't waste your I'm breath. I'm a lawyer. I can, nobody right. can do this. I can this. sue him off, you know, but <laughs> I'm like, really, you, you just want to like push it and just kind of look at it like they were so mad at how amazing I am that they went out of their way to this stupid ripoff report because you just have to look at that. I mean, but you, what you touch on here, I think, is the most important part of digital marketing today, and that is we are in a um, like an, a review based economy. Oh my goodness! I mean, everybody Holy looks for cow. Amazon. Half of that platform is just about the reviews. That's how yeah. most people buy on it. They yeah. look for the reviews. Yeah, they look. For you go reviews. search for stuff on on local. You're looking at the reviews. You want to go to a restaurant. You're looking at Yelp and TripAdvisor. It it's everybody wants that social proof. So if you don't take control of your reputation online, it will take control of you like it's doing to your client. Absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. So I'm going to send this video to him on the podcast. Be like, why are you talking about me? But it's really important. I mean, it really is important. Well, that um, client you said was he's out in, uh, isn't he out in Florida? No, he's in Austin. I know. I'm just you know, okay. I'm trying to cover for you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's in Austin. He's a dead. No, he's in Austin. Okay. Right. Right. So, you know, interesting. I have a, a, again, I can't say names, but I was at a mastermind with a, uh, you know his name if I say it. I'll say it to you in the green room. And he's really big in SEO. Uh, I call it a bl- black hat kind of guy. Ooh. And he tells this story. And I got, I, I, of course, cannot say it the way he does because he's hilarious and he cracks everybody up. And he was telling the story that, I don't even know why he did it, but he found out there was a CEO of a major company, not Fortune 500, but a pretty big company. The CEO's name was the same as a guy who was a pedophile. Oh, man. Yeah, same name. Already starting to get rid it's good, interesting, right? We're like, yeah. what? You know, and he basically found this out and he, I guess he kind of took it on himself that he reached out to their marketing department and they basically hung up on him and the you know big company on and on and on and on it goes somehow he got in front of the oh, the main guy CEO the board in a boardroom CEO marketing department whatever vice president he got him on got him in a conference call he wasn't there he got him on a conference call and he said I if you write me a check for 50,000 right now I can actually get a, have that all go away and the guy's like who do you think you are we pay thousands of dollars to agencies and he's like I could do it watch this and so he's on he's on the conference line and he did something with the their website so he goes press refresh on this site and it basically he said he flipped it to a big f u <laughs> and oh then he God. flipped it off he goes And then watch this. And he flipped it. So all of a sudden, something happened with the name went away for a minute. And then it came back. And the CEO goes, write him a check. And he hung up on him. He's like, write him a check. And he did it for him. He just, he did something to push down this pedophile. That's pretty it was hardcore. Really cool. I don't have anything like, like that. That's, um, yeah, but that sounds like somebody's floating kind of. Uh, who knows if fringes. it's a good, true story? But the point is, the point, the point of that story that what I thought was interesting is here's the CEO of this major company who had this major problem that when they typed his name in, yes, there was literally a picture of somebody else with his name and it said arrested and convicted of oh, yeah. pedophilia, you know, and then the one underneath it was his like LinkedIn profile, and he's a. The company is on uh, the stock exchange, 
And sure. they paid thousands of dollars for other companies to handle it, and no one was able to push it, right? And so they were willing to pay whatever to get that handled, you know? So I thought that and was really interesting. I mean, when it hits you close to home like that, obviously I think people are really motivated to do stuff. But you know what ends up happening a lot is it's – it's just like I said, you get, it's everybody looks for this stuff. They're going to look for you online. They're going right. to look for stuff in your company online. So you don't wait for something bad to show up at the top. You right. do start doing it now because it's going to happen sooner or later to the best of and us. And what, you know what, what could you start doing right now to kind of prevent that? Can you give us some tips or just people to like, what do I start doing? You know, I don't think you can really ever prevent the folks that are going to fly off the handle because oh, everybody that does something you're going to do stuff but you can definitely take control of your reputation management and i think everybody should day one and that's um you know trying to document every single one of your great the great transactions that you have online in some way shape or form i mean literally everything that we do um i tr i look at people as a potential review including you um and then what we do is we send review funnels out and did we share knowledge did you like our service and we get we just make that part of our process trying to get that feedback back some of it's feedback to see if it comes back negative we can improve our process some of it's like okay if it's positive let's incentivize this person to go post that online somewhere so that we can reuse it and use that as part of our social proof and it really works it does two things one it prevents you it gives you it backs you up because you've got this big body of social proof against that one thing that might happen to you later that you might be able to get uh, take care of versus just having that one thing and also it just provides a lot of stuff to help you convert i mean we go look for us in kansas city you like you type up kansas city web designer kansas city seo i mean we just have reviews through the roof right so it makes us look like we're on everybody's short list as soon as they find us right especially when you get that when you marry up high organic rankings which already kind of almost conveys a little bit of trust and authority and merit just by nature of being high with that social proof that's really visible in terms of reviews and, and you know and the star ratings and other places you might show up on the page i mean that's really the holy grail to me of, of uh, digital marketing but I mean, a lot of it it doesn't matter these if you're going for a bit especially if you're going for a bigger ticket item everybody's looking for somebody else. they don't want to hear how great you are it's worthless if you say it yeah. If somebody else says it, it's worth like a hundred grand. You know what I mean? So it's got you got to have be able to stack the deck that way, and that's why even in web design these days, we really try and design websites to to capture you know, get that no like and trust within thirty seconds. So you're like stack the deck from top to bottom. You know, call to action, lots of testimonials, all sorts of things to show proof, track record, and all kind of stuff. Because really these days, your digital presence to me is almost like. Um, you know, it's almost like being judge and jury. You're trying to show the evidence why you're the best over the other guy. Because most people that are looking for stuff, they're just looking for the guy or the woman. You know, I mean, they want they want a reason to choose you. And I think a lot of it comes back to just documenting all the good things that you do and make sure you give people incentive or some reason to put that online so that you can reuse that later. It's like you're going to do a five star review, right? Phil for my podcast. Wink, 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 wink. I've already got it written. Oh, <laughs> thank you so much. You're I have adorable. Written, but not, not any kind of intro. <laughs> ring, 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 call. That. <laughs> well, you know, that's a really good point. I think that it's, it's one of those things that a long time ago we didn't have to deal with, and we do have to deal with on, online reputation now, uh, especially if you have a name that's simple like Smith you know, or Jerry Smith or whatever, you have to really make sure you're on top of that and that you'd really look at, you have to distinguish yourself really quickly. And one last question before we go, and one I wanted to see, well, first off, ask this question, where can people find you? Well, I mean, the little website that could, kcwebdesigner.com is kind of where we do all of our local boutique agency stuff. SEOforgrowth.com is where I wrote the book, so there's a whole book website on that. And I hang out on LinkedIn more than anybody else. I'm not a big, I told you I'm an introvert, so anything I do is on, on LinkedIn, I don't kind of, I don't share much personal stuff on the other platforms, but so LinkedIn. I was like actually going to ask you a question for about LinkedIn. So I heard this is a cup. This is like two years ago from an SEO guy that LinkedIn um, business pages were really good. Is that still true? I think it's a, for for instance the gentleman that you think that that might need the reputation help. Yeah, that would be one that you could stack up because if you do it right. It's got a lot of weight. The yeah. page is almost like a mini web page. And if yeah. you do a little bit of SEO and optimize it, you can almost surely have that be one of the 10 that helps push down, you know, like a rip off report type thing. So I think LinkedIn's super, super valuable. I mean, it ranks better, eat more easier than a Facebook page, I think. So LinkedIn which is company another. page. We're talking about company pages, right? Well, I personally, I mean, I think a personal page, you could also get the company page up, but a personal page, like if you type right now, Phil Singleton, I've got this one guy who's 20 years older than me that's got PhilSingleton.com. 
and he owns it because he's been around so long and works for the government. But the next, all, all the rest of them are mine, pretty much. He works thing. for the government. That's why. I am. And as I put it there. He, Google, he did something with Google. <laughs> that's <laughs> funny. But, well, um, that's but LinkedIn, point. I was going to say, LinkedIn's even all the stuff that I do. I yeah. think my, my web page is one of LinkedIn's like two or three. So Yeah. Uh, yeah. I just heard that from the guy. He does some SEO work, and he said that he really focused on the key, making a company page. It was something like, I don't remember, Colorado SEO agency and he just really focused on that company page and it was like popped up because company pages on LinkedIn were so heavy and I thought that was really interesting. So uh, I just was curious. Barnacle, people... Barnacle SEO is what a lot of people call it. What's it, that you know, called? Figuring out a, well, it's trying What's to it? leverage the authority of a big website yeah. and do SEO on that so at least you can get some visibility yeah. on that piece of it because you're leveraging their the authority of that domain that website. Oh, that makes sense. I kind of like that. Okay, cool. Okay, well, say your website again for your books. They can go check it out. SEOforgrowth.com. SEOforgrowth.com. All right, so go check that out. This guy's really cool. He's fun, even though he's in Kansas City. We'll let it go. (laughs) I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Uh, So my name is Heather Havenwood. Check us out at heatherhavenwood.com forward slash podcast. And thank you so much, Phil, for being here. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You're welcome. Are you frustrated by the weight you can't lose? One sneaky ingredient goes by 61 different names and isn't required on food labels, but it could be causing those stubborn pounds to stay stuck. That extra weight is not your fault. A new report, The Hidden Culprit Sabotaging Your Weight Loss, is available now at heathercleanliver.com, reveals this ingredient and how it's preventing you from losing weight. If you're struggling and you want to break free from dieting misery, visit Heather cleanliver.com right away and get your free report. It's an eye opener. What you don't know could be hurting you. The extra weight is not your fault. Visit heatherscleanliver.com. Thank you for listening to The Win with Heather Havenwood. Interested in coaching with Heather? Go to heatherhavenwood.com and sign up for a business discovery consultation. Here is your free gift for listening. Get three audio chapters of Heather's book, Sexy Boss, How Women Empowerment is Changing the Rulebook, when you text the word sexy to 7200. Again, text the word sexy, that is S-E-X-Y, to 7200, and receive your three audiobook chapters. Number is good only in North America. This is a sexy boss rap. This podcast is a copyright of Havenwood Worldwide, LLC.